my back is turned to him and I feel this boot. He holds up this bottle to me um, and you know, I'm, I'm saying, did, did you drink this whole thing? What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts and this video is a few days later than it should be and there's a really good reason for that. As I explained on my community page, I've had a really busy week I was on a lecture tour where I got to speak at some amazing events about behavior analysis and body language and I wanted to watch Amber Heard's entire testimony before I got the scenes that I thought were important and the most telling and I did that and I've caught some amazing stuff that I think you guys are really going to enjoy. So let's start right now. My father um, broke horses and did construction, Had um, he painted houses. Um, and uh, hunted and fished, but that was for fun. I, I would help him, I was more of a, a crash test dummy, you know, when you train a horse, you, it, it's a wild animal, it doesn't necessarily like to be um, ridden. I was the son he never had, so it was my job to, you know, stay on. All right, now as you guys know, I love to start by establishing a baseline because lie detection really, really depends on how far we deviate from our baseline and there are certain things that hold more or less weight depending on how often we do them. Now you might be thinking to yourself, why do we need to establish a baseline? We already did one with her deposition six years ago. But for me, the more recent the baseline and more situational the baseline, the better it is. First thing, this is happening a lot and I haven't seen this in her before when she speaks. Very often at the end of her sentences or like mid-sentence, she'll stop and she'll do this thing where her lips are compressed and raised. And it often comes with that, that inwards breath or this sort of like a nod as she looks around. And it's happening quite a lot. Now this tight raised lips thing, which we call a mouth shrug, typically happens for one of two reasons. And the interesting thing is in her case, I think it's actually both. It goes back and forth. The first reason is, the best way to describe it is, it's the physical way of saying, I don't know what else to tell you. So notice how sometimes you're talking and you might say something like this and usually the shoulders go up and you look at them like, sorry, I don't know what else to tell you. So it's when we're at a loss of words. So I do believe that there are certain cases where she wants to say more, she wants to sell more of this story, but she's like, I don't know what else to add here. I don't know what else to say. The second reason this happens is shared grief or seeking pity, which is more or less the same thing. Think about any event where a bunch of people are feeling pity and sharing grief, like a funeral, for example. You might walk in and you might see someone you know and they might look at you and go like this. And there's a little bit of that, you know, it, it's hard to express in words how I feel, but the reason that happens is the following. When we're sad, when we're actually grieving, our chin tenses up. And it's really hard to smile when there's tension here. It looks weird, look. Like it's really, really hard to do. So in that setting, when you're grieving, when you're sad, and you see someone and you want to extend a polite smile, it's really hard to actually smile. So the best we come up with most of the time is this. It's an acknowledgement and isn't this sad. So in the case of Amber, I think she's doing this as a mechanism to seek pity, to like be like, I'm grieving, share this grief with me. Speaking of seeking pity, listen to the language that she's using when she describes her childhood. In that one sentence where she talks about, you know, the things she used to do with her father, first she says, I was a crash test dummy, when she talks about riding horses, then she says, I was the son he never had. These are pity seeking sentences and I believe she's beginning this mechanism of seeking pity from the jury. This is something that I think has served her well throughout her life to get sympathy from people and I think she's throwing these lines in there to begin the sympathy seeking process. Besides that, we're seeing a relatively calm person, not too many signs of stress here, it's just someone telling her life story and we haven't gotten to the emotional part yet but it's nice to know that this is her baseline. There are certain things that you do in the job to um, be professional, like when you have to do that sort of scene and you don't like, you, <laughs> you don't use your tongue if you can't, if you can avoid it. Did he use his tongue? Yes. Okay. That right there was, for me, the first big red flag in her testimony. Now I don't talk about this very often, but I spent years as a therapist specializing in people who are trying to get over loss 
or really bad breakups. And as such, I worked with a lot of people who were in abusive relationships. In an overwhelming majority of cases, when that person spoke about how they first met or any physicality between them and their eventual abuser, you would normally see expressions that are consistent with disgust. So even thinking back to when they were physically together, you would see these cringes, you would see the nose crinkling. It's not a pleasant memory for them. It's very unlikely that she would reminisce on their first kiss, which is what she's doing in this scene, and him putting his tongue in her mouth and get all giddy and smiley and almost like she's feeling those butterflies again. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I am saying it's highly improbable. As you guys know, I rarely speak in absolutes because there are exceptions to every rule and one of the first things we learn in behavior analysis is to consider all options. So why is she doing this? Why is she smiling this way? Well, I believe that it's because Amber Heard is on the stand to tell a story. And the way we tell stories is, as the narrative progresses, our emotions change. She is telling this story from the perspective of Amber Heard back then, who didn't know what was about to happen. She's at the beginning of her story. All right, now we're gonna jump into where the abuse actually starts and some really interesting signs that we're seeing both verbally and non-verbally. But before we do, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavior analysis. You know, in these kind of arguments, nothing I do is working. I'm uh, walking out of the room, is me leaving him, walking away from me, you know, hey, where are you going? I'm talking to you. That It, it, it went from that to um, pulling me in by, by my arm, um, still shouting at the, about the accusations. Um. I don't know if you heard it, but that right there is one of the biggest red flags for me in this entire testimony. She does something here that she's gonna do one more time later. This is huge. So listen literally to what she's saying. She's trying to describe this scenario that happens a lot where she tries to leave him. She tries to walk away from him, but listen to the words. I think she subconsciously slips up and lets us know what actually happens. Because she says, I'm walking out of the room, leaving him, walking away from me, yelling, hey, where are you going? Walking out of the room is me leaving him, walking away from me, you know, hey, where are you going? I'm talking to you. That doesn't make sense. If she's trying to get away from him, leaving him, I think what she's trying to say is, he's running after me, but she slips up and says, walking away from me. I think for a moment, her mind just freezes and she tells us the reality, which is he was the one walking away from her. When we're being deceptive, what we call the cognitive load is overworked. Basically, what your brain has to do is a lot because to tell the truth it's very simple you remember the truth you tell the truth but to lie first you have to think of every other lie you told and to try to see if what you're about to say is consistent with all that then you have to think of the way you're going to present the lie then you actually have to present the lie then you have to look around the room to see if your lie is being accepted so your brain goes in hyperdrive and every now and then we slip things out without wanting to and immediately after she says this completely nonsensical phrase, leaving him, walking away from me, saying, hey, where are you going? Doesn't make any sense. She freezes up and we see something called speech disfluency and verbal leaks. Basically, it's a, 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 because what's happening is I think her brain is literally slowing down. Then we see a gesture that she does more than once. She says, pulling me in and she does a pulling action. Why is she the one pulling? Usually when we tell a story, especially one that we're reliving, we step into our own role. So if I were to tell you he grabbed my arm, I wouldn't say he grabbed my arm. I would say he grabbed my arm or I felt this on my arm. Imagine if I tell you uh, I was walking down the street and all of a sudden this car came at me. I wouldn't say I'm walking down the street and all of a sudden this car came at me. It doesn't make sense. It's what I'm experiencing. So why does her gesture say pulling me in? Now, there's a difference if we're saying what this person did than what I did. So we see, for example, Johnny Depp at some point say, she threw a bottle and it went by my head. It's like, here's what she did, then here's what happened. But in this case, they were both involved in that scenario. She also says this later when she talks about being pulled by the hair. I remember he, in my apartment in Orange, it would, he would grab me by the hair or he'd grab me by the arm, face, pull me into him. She doesn't say, he pulled me by the hair. She goes, pull me by the hair. Why is she taking the role of the aggressor 
with her gestures. That's really weird. And I got out some of the food I was going to put together for dinner. I went upstairs. Um, I don't know if I came back down in my nightgown at that point or if that was shortly after, but uh, the next thing I remember is uh, coming downstairs and uh, looking for him. All right, so this is her lead-in to the night in Australia, which is something they've both talked about a lot. And there's, if you compare their two stories, it's two entirely different things. And this is her even before she gets to it. And she's sort of leading up to it, thinking about how she's gonna present this. And we are seeing a massive cluster of deception. Now, clusters of deception are the ways we know when someone's likely being deceptive. We see behaviors that indicate deception all happening at the same time that deviate from their baseline. So remember, none of these behaviors mean anything alone. So if I say something, you go, oh, I do that all the time, and when I'm not lying, it doesn't matter. Because if it's just that one thing, it doesn't mean anything. You have to see them together. And second, it has to deviate from your baseline. If you do it all the time, then it's part of your baseline. So we know her baseline. We know what she looks like when she's telling a truthful story, and all these things deviate from that. So first we see a, a lip lick. She licks her lips. And this is something that we do because when we're stressed, our mouth dries up, and this is a way to correct that. It's also a grooming gesture. When we bring moisture to the lips, it makes us more presentable and therefore more believable. Then we see the most researched indication of deception as she touches her face, particularly around the nose. This is not only nose touching, it's also mouth blocking because her hand covers her mouth. So face touching and mouth blocking are both signs that contribute to our cluster. Again, it means nothing alone. You're talking to someone, they scratch their face, it's meaningless, but within a cluster, very, very important. Then we see a lip compression, which again is consistent with withheld opinion, something we didn't wanna say or something we don't wanna say. We also see a ton of eye flutters, just a whole bunch. Now, this kind of is part of her baseline. There are patches where she does this a lot, but here, it's crazy. She just keeps doing these eye flutters, and eye flutters is something that we do when we're having a hard time processing information. Finally, we see a giant slow blink. Her eyes close, stay closed for a second before they open, and this is something we do when we don't wanna face something, when we don't wanna look at something, and it often happens with deception. So all these things happening in quick succession like that, something is really stressing her about what she's saying or what she's about to say. He would make these comments about you know, whoring myself out, but do so in the context of me acting, you know, and he would talk about other actresses who do my role. We are seeing something there that is gonna hold a lot of weight later when she gets into the story of the alleged abuse. Let me start off by saying that I believe what she just said there has some truth to it. Because as you can see, she's not getting all worked up and trying to contort her face. She's speaking with a rather slow cadence. And also, we've seen enough to know that Johnny Depp, especially when he's been drinking, has the capacity to kind of say some crazy things. We've seen it in texts. We've seen a bit of that sort of jealousy. Look at the way she says, uh, hold myself out. So she goes, you know, she pauses, and we see that bit of like disgust, like she's hesitating to say this, pause. Then she says it really fast as her tone dips. Then she goes, but, and, and now she comes back up to move away from that statement. This cadence is very common in people who retell a story of abuse and don't want to relive it because they've made big steps to get past it, to move past it. So often when they come to that moment, you're going to see they go slow down, hesitate. You might see a little bit of disgust as they're, they're trying to go to this unpleasant place that they moved past and you'll see them blurt it out, almost mutter it, and then come back up as they move away from it. So it's really interesting that she does that here because at some point we stop seeing this kind of cadence and that's really, really telling. Now, I wouldn't want you guys to take what I just said as me protecting or making excuses for Amber or me attacking Johnny. The truth of the matter is, and I think a lot of people miss this, I'm not doing either of those things. I often get comments, not just in this case, but in a lot of my videos of people saying, this person's obviously lying, that person is truthful, I could tell this person is full of it, and I don't think most people get that that's not how analysis works. 
if you're polarized or overly emotional and you're using nothing but your intuition, that's not analysis. In fact, a lot of research has shown that when we have formed an opinion and we use emotions and intuition, we are much, much worse at detecting deception than we think we are. So in behavior analysis, we're taught you always have to be objective and you always have to give the benefit of the doubt with each sentence. If you form an opinion and go in with that opinion, the analysis is completely worthless. So I'm not interested in comments like obviously this and totally that. Totally, obviously doesn't exist in my world. We look for things that indicate probability and that's all that this is. I'm not taking sides, I'm just pointing out behaviors. You would think you, you would have a response, but I, as a woman, had never been hit like that. And he slaps me one more time. Hard. I wish so much he had said he was joking. Because it didn't hurt. Didn't physically hurt me. I was just sitting there on this, on, on this carpet, looking at the dirty carpet, wondering how I wound up on this carpet and why I was never why i never noticed that the carpet was so filthy before and i just didn't know what else to do i didn't know what to say i didn't know how to react as a woman i had never been hit like that that's a strange thing for her to say as a woman what does this mean one of two things either she's saying that as as a girl as when she was younger she was slapped that hard but i think it's more likely she's throwing that in there again to gain sympathy as a woman like to remind them that keep in mind that in this relationship I'm the woman. Another thing here is a really great point by my friend Emily D. Baker who brought this up during a live stream and I asked her for permission to talk about it. Emily is an incredible lawyer with an incredible YouTube channel all about law. She covers a lot of legal cases. She used to be a district attorney. Definitely knows what she's talking about and she understands behavior really well and she said that in all the cases of abuse she's ever dealt with, usually the cadence doesn't slow down and become more clear when the victim talks about abuse. It's kind of muttered and sort of said a little bit softer just to get past it because they don't want to revisit it. And I kind of alluded to that when I said that, you know, Amber earlier talking about something else kind of did that, sort of like muttered something that he said that was verbally abusive. But it's such a great point, Emily pointed out, where when she's talking about all these traumatic things, she slows down and really emphasizes it and although it's not impossible, it's very rare to see that. Then she says it didn't hurt physically and we're seeing a lot of this overdramatization that a lot of people have caught. We're also seeing this sadness in her mouth start now, which is going to come up a lot during this testimony. And a lot of people have said it looks fake, but a lot of people don't realize why it looks fake. And I'm going to tell you why. The reason it looks fake is because as an actress, she knows that when we're sad, we frown. In other words, the corners of the mouth go downwards. But she doesn't understand why we frown. So she is activating the muscles of her mouth to move downwards. And she's talking like this. And she's doing a lot of this, this kind of thing as she talks. It starts now and gets a lot worse later. That's not the reason we frown when we're sad. When we're sad, the muscles of the face relax. And as a result, the cheeks droop downwards. And when we open our mouth, and we do open our mouth to, to breathe because we're feeling stressed, as a result, because the cheeks are drooping and the mouth opens, the corners of the mouth subtly go downward. It's not the muscles of the mouth, it's the muscles of the face that are causing the corners of the mouth to go down. When we try to do it with the muscles of our mouth, it looks exaggerated and out of place. Finally, at the end, she's giving a lot of detail about this dirty carpet. And she's saying it didn't hurt physically, but I was on the floor looking at how dirty this carpet was. Well, there's a bit of a contrast there. If you're slapped hard enough to end up on the floor, it's probably going to hurt physically. And now she's giving all this detail about this carpet. And typically, we say truth tellers tell, liars sell. And one of the ways they sell is to give you incredible amounts of detail about things that don't directly involve the act or the event they're talking about. So they feel that by telling you how dirty the carpet was, a part of your mind goes, oh, well, she must be honest about this whole thing because she's giving us all these details about the carpet, so this must have happened. Please keep in mind, it's very difficult for me to say what I just said and some of the things that I'm about to say. As someone who's had his heart broken by stories of abuse, someone who's dealt with victims of abuse, it's very difficult to point out inconsistencies and clusters of deception. Because 
remember, despite what I'm seeing, despite the signs that I'm seeing, despite the feeling that we're all getting, that there's a lot of inauthenticity to this, ultimately, it's possible that there could be truth to this. And I don't want to be the person who doesn't take abuse seriously. So again, I'm not attacking this, I'm not defending this, I'm simply saying, here are the elements that for me don't add up. My dog stepped on a bee, we went to the vet, and went on with our, you know, vacation. We actually went to another location after that and then eventually went home and went about our... Okay, something really interesting happened there with Johnny and his attorney, Ben Chu. So she said her dog stepped on a bee and we see, you know, Ben Chu just sitting there, totally relaxed, and then he realizes something. We see immediately curiosity as the eyebrows go down. Now, eyebrows going down it can be consistent with anger, but usually that's clenched jaw, eyes open. That's not what that was. That was curiosity. Something hit him. He then smiles and ex it, with excitement turns and leans to Johnny Depp, says something. Johnny Depp also smiles and as Ben backs up, we see a thumbs up. Something about this story, what she just said, maybe about the dog in the bee or maybe just a little bit before that, there's an inconsistency that he's happy about. Because then he sits back and his hand comes up like this to block his mouth. Like, I have something to say here, but I can't say it. I have a feeling something's going to come up around that subject during the cross-examination that's going to contradict something else. I don't know what it is. Maybe some of you are a little bit more familiar with the whole story, the whole narrative. You can tell us what that is, but something hit him that he's excited about. And I slowly get up and move to the front of the plane and he starts throwing things at me. Ice cubes, utensils, and I pull my gaze away from him. I walk away from him. My back is turned to him and I feel this boot in my back. He just kicked me in the back. I fell to the floor, I caught myself on the floor, and I just remember feeling so embarrassed. I felt so embarrassed that he could kick me to the ground in front of people. She says that he was throwing things at her, forks, you know, ice cubes, and she turned away, and then she says that she felt a boot on her back, that he kicked her. Now, I did therapy for years, and I've heard stories from people who were in abusive situations. And one of the most common things when they get snuck up on or hit from the back is an ambiguous description of what hit them. Because when you're in that panic, you're turning away, especially because he's throwing things and you feel something hit you, your immediate assumption would be that he just threw something. It's very unlikely that you would know in that moment that the thing that hit you on the back is specifically a boot. This kind of detail is usually consistent with someone who's trying to sell a narrative because that's an outside perspective. He hit me with a boot. If I was looking at it, I would see a boot. The second thing that stands out to me is what she says she was thinking about when she hit the floor. So according to her, she was kicked in the back by a boot, enough to knock her down to the floor of the plane. When something like that happens, we have no conscious say over it. Our subconscious mind takes over and we go into survival mode, freeze, fight, or flight. The only priority in our brain when we're under that much attack physically is to survive. So let's talk about something that I studied in my degree in social psychology, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is a pyramid that represents every human need and we all have this in common. And at the base, we have the most basic things that we all look for. And you can't move up the pyramid unless those bottom things are taken care of. So if we look all the way at the bottom, we have physical needs, things like oxygen and food and shelter. As soon as those physiological needs are met, in other words, the bare necessity we need to be alive, we move on to safety. So the thing we think about most is ways to assure our safety and security. This is pretty low in the pyramid and very basic. It's a high priority. Then on top of that, we have social needs, love and belonging. And on top of that, we have esteem. So listen to what she's saying here. She's been violently knocked down to the ground and what she's thinking about is how embarrassed she is, how embarrassing it is that he would do that in front of other people. That relates to her esteem and her sense of belonging, social belonging. But this is physiologically something we do not think about if our safety and security is threatened. It's pretty much impossible. Anybody who's ever been in a situation where they felt violently attacked or that their safety was attacked 
will tell you that reputation, self-esteem was not something they thought about in that moment. Maybe later they felt embarrassed. It's also possible that if it was a smaller altercation, like somebody yelling at them in public, they might be thinking about that. But in a moment where you are physically fearing for your safety, you are not thinking about things like reputation. Mental condition. It, it doesn't, it's still hearsay, Your Honor. So that's one of the moments that the entire internet is talking about and there's so many theories out there and one of the most popular ones is that she snorted cocaine. I'm going to say this, I don't think Amber Heard is the most intelligent person in the world but I also don't think she's literally the dumbest human being alive. She knows there are countless cameras on her, there's security guards, there's an entire jury watching her. She has demonstrated numerous times that she's trying to appear a certain way. She's vocally against cocaine. So it is literally the stupidest thing she could have possibly done to put cocaine into a Kleenex and take this opportunity where she knows a lot of people are looking at her to snort that. Look, I've studied behavior and body language analysis my entire adult life, but none of what I studied can explain to me what just happened. I, I honestly think it's just the weirdest and most unfortunate sort of thing that she did without really thinking about it, and it just looks really, really bad. And at some point, I'm in his face, and he had, he, I don't know if he had let go of my neck or loosened my grip, but I remember slapping him across the face. Okay, I have nothing to tell you about that clip right now, but I just want you to make a mental note of that. The fact that she said she was being held down and then she slapped him across the face. There was no ambiguity there. She said she slapped him across the face. Just put a bookmark on that because this relates highly to something she says later and it's gonna be really important. I am in a, in a, like a, a struggle with him where I'm holding his shirt lapel um, and he kind of just flings me, for lack of a better way to describe it, throws me um, across the room. I land on the, a games table, it's like a ping pong table. And I don't know if I was holding on to him or if he pursued me separate, but he gets on top of me on the games table and is just whacking me in the face, like repetitive and um, he holds up this bottle to me um, and you know I'm, I'm saying did, did you drink this whole thing? There are two things here that can't be ignored. First of all the first part of that story makes absolutely no sense. She says that he flung her or threw her across the room and she landed on top and with her hand she gestures like this she landed on top of a ping pong table. So it's not that he threw her a foot or two, but he flung her across a room with enough height for her to land on a ping pong table. On top of that, she says, and I don't know if it's because I held on to him, but he landed on top of me. So she's alleging that there's a possibility that not only did he throw her, but he threw her with such strength that she held on to him and they both went flying high enough to land on top of a ping pong table. I'm sorry, like I'm so sorry, but this narrative just does not make sense. You know, he pushed me, I fell onto a table, I hit the side of a table, maybe. But to throw an adult across a room to land on top of a table, it doesn't make sense. Then at the end, we get a really big red flag and another shift in perspective, which she's done once before and it's not a good look. She goes, he holds up this bottle, he holds up this bottle and then she says, and I'm saying, did you drink this whole thing? And she's gesturing like she's the one holding the bottle. Um, he holds up this bottle to me um, and you know, I'm, I'm saying, did, did you drink this whole thing? So I think that this is a really bad subconscious slip. She's in this mess, she's trying to sell this narrative, I often talk about cognitive load, so her brain is really trying to keep up with all the gymnastics it has to do to sell this story and in that moment, I think she says, you know, he's holding this bottle because that's what would contribute to the narrative but then she slips up for a moment and the truth comes out that indicates that she's the one holding the bottle saying, did you drink this whole thing? I pick it up and I slam it down on the ground right in between us. 
is a tile floor, a white tile floor. And I smashed the bottle on the floor. I, 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 I honestly don't remember if I um, threw anything in his direction. I, I don't think I did. Um, I just remember him having me by the nightgown. Um, I remember him flailing me, throwing me around. I'm flailing. Um. Here we see a cluster of deception. Uh, first of all, we see uh, a, a face touch and a mouth block. There's actually something called the Pinocchio effect. Look it up, it's hilarious. Some people, when they're being deceptive, the heat around their nose increases. There's a lot of theories as to why this happens, but we're not a thousand percent sure why. I think the most likely reason is when we're stressed, we need more oxygen. So, you know, the blood going to the nose helps us breathe more effectively and better. Anyways, whatever the reason, this causes an itching sensation and some people, when they lie, scratch their nose. So she's doing that there. She doesn't do it a whole lot throughout this entire testimony. And one of the times she did do it, it was within a cluster. Also, it's not just a nose scratch, it's also a mouth block. Then we see a perception qualifier. She says, honestly, it's not something she says very often. She has said things like that before, but honestly, sincerely, you know, words like that are called perception qualifiers because they're meant to just kind of convince people like quickly, like, no, no, I'm being honest. Uh, again, alone, meaningless, but within a cluster, it's important. Then we have the single-sided shrug. This is really important. We see one of her shoulders, her left go up alone. When we actually don't know something and we're missing information, both our shoulders tend to go up and they come down rather quickly. So when we're lacking knowledge, both shoulders go up. But when we're lacking confidence in what we're saying, like we know it's not the full story, one shoulder tends to go up. So that's really significant. Furthermore, a lot of people in my comments noticed this, so congrats, great catch. She's gesturing no as she's saying these things. Now, gesturing no isn't always a bad thing. If you're saying something negative, like um, I can't believe it, or there's no way that would happen, no is obviously okay. Also, some people emphasize with no gestures. Say something like, it was incredible, but this is more like this one big gesture. Can this be disbelief? Like she can't believe she did this, it can. But since it's in this cluster, it also can contribute to deception. Then we see lip biting. She bites the inner lip and we see the whole mouth go like this. Anything where we limit the movement of our lips, you know, so biting, compression, is withheld opinion. There's something that we don't want to say or we're trying not to say. And finally, we get a lot of details about unimportant things. Like I threw the bottle on the ground and it was tile, it was white tile. So specifics are important. If the specifics are about the event, that's fine. But if it's about something completely irrelevant, it's a mechanism that we use to gain trust. Like we're saying, like, listen, I'm giving you all the facts here. The tile was white and it was a tile floor. So I'm being honest here, especially because she talks about those details and then says, I can't remember if I threw something at him. So let me get this straight. You remember throwing a bottle on the floor. You remember that it was white tiles on the floor, but you don't remember if you threw a bottle at him. Now remember, I always say this in my videos, people who are being deceptive and people who are being honest, but think that people may not believe them have very similar body language and nonverbal signs. So it's very hard to distinguish between the two. So at the very least, she really, really wants to be believed. And he's throwing these bottles one after the other and I can feel glass breaking behind me. I remember feeling um, one of them go by my head really fast. I mean, the, a, a real velocity. So that to me is really interesting because not only in his testimony, but also in his deposition, Johnny Depp described that incident almost in that exact same way. Like he said, she threw a bottle, it went right by his head, he did that gesture, and she just did it here as well. Now, she's seen his deposition, she saw him on the stand a couple of days ago, and I've said this before, her cadence, which is slow with this hesitation and these pauses, which isn't very normal for her, is a very Johnny Depp way to speak. So I think that it's very likely that she saw him on the stand and there are certain mannerisms and certain ways of speaking that she adopted because she sees how credible he is 
and she's trying to simulate that credibility. I'm, lo I, I'm looking at it in his eyes and I don't see him anymore. I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him, it was black. I've never been so scared in my life. It was, it was black, I couldn't see him. There are people who naturally have an increased ability to empathetically connect with people and we call them empaths. It's not a magical, mystical voodoo thing, it's just the parts of some people's brains that regulates human to human connection is a little bit more developed. And there are a lot of you who follow this channel. And when I did the breakdown of Johnny Depp's uh, testimony, I said that I have a feeling that the empaths were going to connect with a certain part because it felt deeply emotional. I will bet that those same empaths in this scene didn't feel a thing. So it's weird, right? Because we see her face doing some stuff and she's talking fast and her tone is up here. But there's a few things that are inconsistent with what you would expect to see if someone was having this kind of a fit. First and foremost, her breathing. We actually hear her taking deep breaths between her sentences. When we're stressed or we have high anxiety and we're panicking, we don't take deep breaths. We take very short and fast breaths. So it sounds more like, <laughs> more like this, and we're not getting much of that. Second, I've talked about this before, but her mouth. We see this downwards gesture with her mouth, but that's only because she knows what sadness is supposed to look like, but doesn't know why. And most importantly, and this has really, really been bugging me for the last week, we've seen her deposition from 2016, where she spoke about a lot of these events and we never saw this. We saw anger, we saw her getting worked up, but we never saw this kind of, you know, forced sadness and this high pitch and this panic and this drama. We didn't see that. How is it possible that six years ago, which is a lot closer to these events, she was talking about these things with a pretty much straight face and a little bit of anger and a little bit of spite, but nothing close to this. Usually, as time goes by, we get less emotional about events, not more emotional, and certainly not to this degree. This is text messages from Mr. Depp to you. Do you recall these? Yes, I do. And, and are these the text messages? Yes, that's what he was sending me while I was taking care of his daughter. Now we're seeing actual tangible evidence of text that Johnny sent her. And if you look at this, it's pretty crazy. At first, it's extremely incoherent, just like this crazy babble. Then it becomes quite condescending, and I would consider some of this verbally abusive. Even the way she's not responding, and he just keeps spamming her and saying demeaning things. And you know, throughout this video, I've really been on Amber's case, so let's balance things out a little bit. I've said this before, I don't think by any means that either one of them is a saint. I don't think either one of them can wash their hands of this and absolve themselves of guilt entirely. Also, we see a lot of evidence here submitted where, you know, he wrote on the mirrors and on the walls and he broke things and, and we've, we've heard this and we've seen evidence of this. We see that things can get crazy and he can get pretty crazy when he's triggered. Um, not just here, but also there's some apology texts, which I'm going to put up on the screen right now. And if you guys want to pause to read them because they're really long, you can go ahead and do that. And in these apology texts, we see that he recognizes that there's a monster in him and that he did some things that were really inappropriate and that he's apologizing for a lot. Now, in fairness, I do want to point out that nowhere in those texts does he ever acknowledge getting physical. And if he did get physical, I feel like he would have mentioned it because he's really making amends and really like cleansing his soul and pouring his heart out to her and apologizing and saying things are going to change and nowhere in there does he say, I shouldn't have touched you. And nowhere in her responses does she say, Johnny, that's unacceptable, you hit me. There's no, no one is alluding to physical violence. So his history denotes with his ex-wives that it's not something he does and I must admit that the way she speaks, these exaggerations, the inconsistencies of her story, doesn't to me indicate that his abuse goes beyond verbal. But it does look like they get each other going and, and things build up and it's just a toxic relationship. And this is such great evidence of that. You see my little sister with her back on, face, her back to the staircase and Johnny swings at her and I don't even wait and I, swung at him. 
and all of my time, all my time of being in that relationship to that point <sighs> hadn't even landed one on Johnny. Sure, I tried to fight back, threw my arms, flailed my arms, hit whenever I, I could to try to block blows myself, but never landed anything. Oof. I think you all know where I'm going with this, and it's bad. She says very clearly, and takes her time with it, that she never landed anything. You know that she protected herself, and in defending herself, she may have inadvertently hit him and all these things, but she says, I never, this was the first time she landed something. We literally heard her say earlier in her testimony that she slapped him across the face in a different altercation. It's there. I showed it to you guys earlier. I told you to remember it. I don't remember slapping him across the face. This directly contradicts that. She's saying this is the first time she landed anything. And in that other you know, story, there was no ambiguity there. It wasn't like I mistakenly slapped him. It's I slapped him across the face. So that is a direct contradiction. That's a lie. Those two things cannot coexist. So yeah, it's not, it's not a great look. There's a lot of exaggeration. There's a lot of feigned emotion. There's clusters of deception. There's things that don't add up. Again, is it possible that some of this is true? Yes, it is. In fact, I, I don't think anything is ever white and black. So I think that there are bits of truth to this, but I think it's being contorted so much that it's literally impossible to know where, if any, truth lies. But anyways, the trial is on break for a week and then uh, it's gonna be cross-examination. I bet there's gonna be more of this and then cross-examination. By the way, if you're interested in following this live, I'm constantly on a channel called Legal Bites in and out. I'll leave a link in the description. They cover the case in real time and you have some of the best lawyers in the world commenting on it and I pop in every now and then to give my perspective so you guys could follow that and you can catch me there. Until then, let me know what you thought in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry if it seemed very opinionated. It's not, I'm just showing the behavior, but there is a lot going on. So I hope that was okay and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.